you had mentioned, my name is Anna, and I'm going to be talking to you today with Allison a little about um, the devices that we're building to give the human brain a way kind of to speak to us, or for us to listen to what's going on and understand what's going on in the brain. Um, some of you may be wondering, what exactly is it, or what field is it that people participate in if they're going to study and build devices for the brain? And it's actually bioengineering. And people who work in bioengineering are not just bioengineers, not just engineers, not just biologists, but chemists, like myself, and um, computer scientists. People basically with any kind of background you can imagine. Um, for me personally, when I was in high school, I knew that I liked science, I knew that I was interested in the brain, and I also knew that I really liked English and reading books. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I went to college, so I applied to a lot of colleges, and I actually was offered a chemistry scholarship, so I became a chemist. And luckily I liked it enough that I not only got my undergraduate in chemistry, but I continued on and got my PhD. But that's kind of how I personally ended up getting into the field of neuroscience starting as a chemist. But I'll let Allison talk a little bit more about how she found herself in this job. And as for me, well, when I was applying to colleges, I actually had no idea what I wanted to do. I honestly applied undeclared everywhere. And what happened was actually, you know, the first time I was an undergrad, I was looking at classes, I had a friend drive me to his intro to engineering class, and I thought, sure, I'll, I'll sit in, why not? And what I really enjoyed, actually, was finding out how much problem solving there was involved in engineering. And from there, I decided I would do chemical engineering, and from there, I decided I liked chemical engineering so much, I would pursue it um, during my PhD, so. So, Alice and I both work at Lawrence Livermore National Labs, where our bioengineering group actually has a lot of different types of projects going on. Everything I'm going to be talking to you today about is what we call in vivo systems. So these are devices that we build to go into the bodies. Um, the ones we're talking about are in the brain, but these could be anywhere in the body. We also build ex vivo systems. So if any of you went to the cancer uh, science on screen a few weeks ago, that one was talking about these test beds, right, that you can build up to study biology outside of the body, to do things like monitor cancer growth, to look at how specific brain cells interact with each other. And then we also have a group called in silico systems. So this is using computers to model what goes on in the body or in interfaces between the body and the brain. Today we're going to be talking about the brain, right, which is part of the central nervous system labeled here on the left as the CNS. Um, and that is, again, your brain and your spinal cord are the central nervous system. There's also the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS, and that is all of the nerves that go from the tips of your fingers back up to your spinal cord. So that's the system that really allows you to put your hand out, touch something that's hot, and immediately pull your hand away instead of waiting for that burn to go all the way up your arm, right? So that's that system, the peripheral nervous system. Um, sticking back with the brain, which is what we're going to be talking about today, your brain um, is not just a mass with no, it is in fact a bunch of cells that are specifically designed to interact with one another. Um, if we zoom in, these cells are very, very tiny. If we zoom in even more to look at one, there's um, a cell body. That cell body is a few tens of microns wide. So if you want to grab a hair for a second, your hair is about 100 microns wide. Does that give you an idea? And so the, the body of this is about a tenth of that size. Um, to give you, again, to give you an idea of the scale of how small these um, cells are. So this cell body is surrounded by dendrites and then this long axon that goes out to axon terminals. This axon can be many, many, many times larger than the actual cell body itself. And so using this axon, people, um, neurons can communicate with each other. Who's familiar with what this is, the tin can phone? Have you guys ever used one of these, right? Somebody talks on one side, you can have someone across the audience, and instead of needing a microphone, a a string will work to take your voice and bring it to the person on the other side. And this axon works in a lot the same way for cells. So what happens is a cell body has a message it wants to transmit. It will go through that axon terminal using electrical signals, or electri electri sorry, electrical signals, to then move quickly to the next cell body, where it will then transmit its message and it can continue on. And so this is how um, cells in different regions of your brain can rapidly communicate with one another. And what we're working on is building devices that directly interface so that we can listen to and change these electrical signals. So these signals are going on in the brain and we're just gonna try and listen to them and figure out what's going on. There are probably some ideas that you guys have about what a neural interface looks like from the movies. 
Can you guys, if you want to yell out guesses for um, another movie maybe that's not up here that you can think of as a big one? Nothing? Luke Skywalker hand, Star Wars. That's a neural interface as well, even though it's the peripheral nervous system. Um, but again, these kind of ideas about what's going on and how we can interact with the brain are a little bit different from what we're working with right now. To give you an idea, here's a state-of-the-art neural interface. This is what's called a cochlear implant. So in this device, what's happening is around this woman's ear, there's um, kind of a, a white curved device that's actually um, a microphone. So that's picking up noise that's going on in, in this case, what would be happening in this auditorium. There are then electronics that turn that noise that's coming into the microphone into signals that then the transmitter that's on the back right of her head, that actually sends that, those electrical signals into the brain to a device that's set up to directly stimulate the auditory cortex. So essentially what's happening is these microphone signals are coming into her brain to a device that directly interfaces to bypass an ear that's not working. Here's another state-of-the-art neural interface. So what you're looking at here is the um, tips of this device that you're seeing on the left are actually electrodes implanted deep into a human's brain. And what they're doing there is actually working to help keep someone from having cancer. So um, if you guys have ever heard of Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis, there's a number of different disorders where uh, people can no longer control the movement of their limbs. It becomes involuntary that they'll tremor. And so the idea here is what's happening is those neurons are constantly sending out electrical signals. And it's not because they're getting inputs that tell them to, they're just constantly sending them out. So what we do is use a device like this to send out kind of a quiet signal or to say, stop firing. And so this way, instead of having this noise happening and a tremor happening, you can have people who stabilize their hands using technology like this. This is um, another um, device that I want you guys to take a second and guess what maybe you think it does. This is the first neural implant that Lawrence Livermore National Labs made. I want you to take a second, look at it, kind of try and guess what you think it does, and Allison's going to come up and let you guys know a little bit more about what it actually does. All right, thank you, Anna. Um, so now that you've had time to maybe think about what this could possibly be interfacing with, I'm here to tell you that this is actually used to interface with the eye. Um, so this is an artificial retina. Um, this is kind of the first example of a neural interface that Lawrence Livermore actually made. So again, that picture on the left that you see is the exact same picture you saw on the previous slide. And what I want you to draw your attention to is on the right side of that picture where you kind of see that gleam. That's actually a bunch of tiny little microelectrode arrays, which you can also see in this cartoon of the eye on the right side. So that part actually interfaces with the back of the eye. Now each of those microelectrode arrays actually goes out and connects to that electronics package, which is that black ball you see on the left in the picture. And again, you can see that on the side of the eye in this cartoon. So the reason why this artificial retina exists is that there are uh, people who have lost their vision, mainly because of the back of their eye, there's uh, cells that have died. So the way that this artificial retina works is if you have this implanted, the user actually is wearing a pair of sunglasses that are attached to a camera. So say they want to look at this eye chart and read the E at the very top. The camera picks up that image of the E, it transmits it to the electronics package, which again is that bulb on the side of the eye. It then tells the electronics array, or the microelectrode array, to light up in that shape of the E. And now you can interface bypass that layer of dead cells. It tells the optic nerve that this person is looking at an E, and now they're able to see that they're able to read this E. Um, so a few drawbacks to this technology as it exists right now, um, you can see that the shape of the E is not exactly perfect, right, compared to what it actually looks like on the eye chart. Um, however, the fact that they're able to even read this at all does show that a significant improvement in their quality of life. So this is a really tiny device, right? It has to be able to fit in the back of your eye. If we're talking about devices that actually go into the brain, these are also really, really tiny. So here's an example of some neural interface that goes into the brain. But you can see this is actually on a single fingertip, so just how small we are, right? So you might be wondering, well, how are we actually able to make these at such small scales? And the answer is using a technique called microfabrication. 
So I'll walk you through how this works, but essentially what I want you to think of it is it's really similar to building a cave. So we're going to go layer by layer, where you deposit a layer, you pattern it, and you move on to the next layer. So the way this works, we start off with a silicon wafer as kind of our substrate, so you think of that as like the pan for your cake. You then deposit the uh, layer that you want to pattern, so that's going to be either metal or polymer. We then deposit a thin layer of this very special chemical called photoresist. So what's unique about this chemical is that it's actually sensitive to light, so it'll react whenever it sees UV light. What that means is that if we put a special mask on top, so we have this mask that's in the shape of whatever we want to pattern. So parts of this mask are made of glass, so that means if you shine UV light through the mask, it'll travel through the glass and react with that chemical layer underneath, that photoresist. But the dark area, so for example, the dark area in the middle of the mask, the light can't actually penetrate through there, so that means that the photoresist underneath doesn't react with the light. We can then develop the photoresist, so similar to how you would develop an old picture, and now we're left in the photoresist in the exact shape that we want. Now this photoresist acts as a special kind of protective layer, so what that means is that if we were to etch away the layer underneath, so either using chemicals or plasma, it'll etch away everywhere except wherever there's that photoresist mask layer. Finally, we can remove the photoresist mask, and we're left in with the layer in the exact shape that we want. So next, I'm going to show you a little cartoon video that shows how we use these microfabrication techniques to actually make our neural devices, and then how we actually get our devices into the brain. So to start with, again, we have that silicon wafer substrate. We deposit the polymer layer on top of that. We then deposit and pattern the electrode metal layer and the wires. We then deposit the top layer of the polymer. And finally, we etch through the polymer so that it exposes each of those electrodes and also defines the entire shape of the device. Now, each of those electrodes are connected to a tiny wire that goes all the way up to the very top of the device, which is where we add all the, of the electronics that allow us to take recordings from those electrodes. So in this case, this is a little wireless package. Because this device is really flexible, in order to actually get it into the brain, we have to attach this temporary stiffening surgical tool. And so that means during surgery, a doctor could go ahead, implant this device, remove that surgical tool, and now our device is ready for recording. So all of this is done in what is called a clean room. So these are pictures of our actual clean room at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So in the picture on the left, you can see my colleague, she's in, uh, inspecting one of our neural interfaces in the very front. And then on the right, you can see another one of the rooms, which is actually where we do a lot of that patterning and the microfabrication that I talked about earlier. So one thing you might notice is that every single person in these pictures is wearing this rid ridiculous costume, right? They're basically covered from head to toe. You can really only see their eyes. The reason behind that is, well, it's called a clean room. And actually, in order to keep the clean room clean, we have to reduce the amount of contaminants that could potentially be introduced to our devices. And the biggest source of contaminants, actually, is yourself. So if you think about just the dust on your clothes, your hair, even some of your skin, if any of that were to accidentally come off and get onto the devices that you're trying to make, because what we're making is so, so small, that means it could potentially ruin our device. So the reason why everybody's wearing all of these, what we call bunny suits, it's not to protect ourselves from what we're making, it's to protect our devices from us, essentially. In addition, um, in order to make a clean room clean, we have to highly filter the air. So to really emphasize exactly how clean this is, uh, our clean room is called a class 100 clean room. And what that means is that in every cubic foot of air, you can count fewer than 100 particles. Now to show you exactly how clean that possibly is, in this auditorium, in that same exact volume of air, there's more than a million, all right? So even though you can't see, you think this air is clean, it's not compared to a clean room. So now that I've shown you how microfabrication works, I wanted to show you an example of how we use this to make actual neural interfaces. So this is a neural interface used to uh, study a rat brain. And you might be wondering, well, why rats? Anna and I have been talking about human use this entire time. The reason behind this is that a lot of our devices have never been made before. So you might imagine the very first time I ever make a device, you wouldn't want me to take it out of my clean room and go ahead and implant it into your grandma or your brother and sister, right? So instead, we work with neuroscientists so that they use these to study animal brains so that we can better understand how those brains work, and we can also understand how our devices work. 
So here on the left side, we have a picture of our actual device. At the very top is actually where we clip in, that's all of our electronics. And at the very bottom where that blue box is, if we zoom in, we get that picture on the right. So that's a picture taken underneath the microscope. And each of those little four shapes, again, if you hold up one of your hairs, it's about the width of one of your hairs. It's about 100 micrometers wide. So these are all really, really tiny. And each of those black dots on each of those shapes is actually one individual electrode that can be used to listen to the surrounding neurons. So next, I'm going to play for you a sound, and I want you to think about what you might be listening to as I play it. let you listen to what it sounds like to get electrical data out or listen to these electrical signals going on in the brain. But where do we go from there? What's next? And the idea is your brain is more than just electrical activity. Um, there's blood vessels, which is what you're seeing at the bottom of the screen here. There's chemicals coming in and out of the bloodstream and going between all of these cells as well. And so we want to look at everything that's going on in the brain, not just the electrical signals. Um, Again, communicating isn't just electrical signals, it's electrical and chemical signals. Um, when this tin can phone analogy happens, when the electrical signals come, go quickly through the string, there still ultimately has to be something that goes between the can and the ear, or that next cell that, that listens. 
And so it's actually chemicals that transfer between one cell to the next one. And this happens in a small region between two different cells called the synapse. So um, there's the axon terminal, right, that is where a signal is released. It goes through the synapse. The synapse is a few hundred nanometers large. So that's much, much, much smaller than even a micron, which again, hair is 100 microns, right? So imagine something that's a thousand times smaller than this is when you start to think about the size for where this chemical transfer is happening. And that happens pretty rapidly since it's such a small space. That's why we want to try and make that as small as possible in your body. But we're going to zoom in and we're going to talk about what happens in this little synapse. Um, it's not just pink dots, right, that are going around. This might not be a surprise to you guys. You probably, if you see blood or any other solution, it's not full of like little round dots. Um, but if we zoom in any further, these are actually chemicals, right? And it's not just one chemical, it's not just one molecule. Um, these, there's a bunch of what we call in the brain specifically neurotransmitters that are taking place there. So again, this is a ton of different molecules. Um, if you guys have heard of norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, there's a ton of different molecules that are released in these synapse, synapses. But instead of using colored circles, and instead of using the specific molecular formulas, because it's a Saturday, we are going to use Lucky Charms to discuss these. So just keep in mind, breakfast cereal or anything else can be used as a marker, but what these really are are specific um, neurotransmitters being released in your brain. So we want to see specifically which neurotransmitters, or in this case, which Lucky Charms, are in an area, right? You just want the marshmallows, or in this particular example, for some reason, we just want the other part, the non-marshmallows. And so you have to be able to tell what's in the cereal or what's in this mixture. And we use what's called an electrochemical biosensor to do that. And so what this is, is a chemical sensor is a surface that's been modified in some way to selectively interact with just one of these cereal pieces. So in this case, the surface has been modified to only interact with that chemical fish. Anytime a fish binds or comes near that surface, you will have um, an event that happens. So that's what those green arrows are indicating. And that binding event will be transduced or translated essentially into an electrical signal that then we can read out on a computer the same way um, you guys were listening to the electrical signals earlier directly being read. Uh, this idea of using chemical sensors in the body is not new. I'm sure everyone in this audience knows someone who has diabetes. People with diabetes regularly check their blood glucose using a biosensor. So again, it's a strip or a modified surface that will uh, bind specifically to glucose and tell you how much glucose is present. So what we're doing is the same kind of signaling mechanism but on a much, much smaller scale and using this electrical output so that we can read this the same way we do our electrical signals. So what does a chemical neural interface look like? So Allison showed you a, an interface earlier that's directly just for listening to electrical signals. In this device here, what you're seeing at the very top is on the far left, those are two connectors that I can use to physically plug into a computer to get the information from a device out. On the far right, circled in that very tip, is actually the part of the device that goes into the brain. And on that part, if you zoom down to the bottom, what you can see is there's both electrical and chemical sensors. Forgive me. So the smaller dots that are kind of that bright blue color, those are, for look, those are actually 20 microns in diameter, and those are for looking or listening to the electrical signals going on in the brain. The larger circles, those are platinum disks of metal that we've modified in a way I'll show you in a little bit to actually look at the electrical signals or the chemical signals going on in the brain. Um, on this particular device, these sensors have been spread out in a particular way for a specific application that I'll talk about a little bit more. But one of the great things about microfabrication and that process that Allison showed you is any kind of device you could imagine to target specific spots or specific chemicals in the brain, you could draw out and you could microfabricate. So that sensor that I just showed you is specifically designed to look at glutamate in the brain. And glutamate is, well one, it's everywhere in your body. It, um, there's 10 grams of it in your body, which is um, Maybe not that much if you think about the fact that most of us probably weigh well over 100 pounds, but if you think about the fact that there's a lot of other things there and this is just one signaling molecule, it's actually a pretty large percentage. Um, and a lot of that glutamate is actually in your brain. And in the brain, when you have normal levels of glutamate, normal signaling for glutamate, you see, um, or this optimal amount, you see uh, typical learning memory and movement. 
So again, this idea where I was talking about earlier, people who may have a hand tremor or something like that, they cannot control necessarily the <coughs> because the glutamate signaling is not optimized for their brain any longer. Um, again, you have too, too low glutamate, you also have such a brain development, memory issues, exhaustion, insomnia, all of these things can be linked to having reduced levels of glutamate in your brain. On the other hand, um, if your glutamate levels are too high, you can have things like autism spectrum disorder. So the movie Adam that you guys are all going to stay and see after this is um, about a kid who specific, or an adult who specifically has um, Asperger's syndrome. So that is actually on the autism spectrum, that is a part of the autism spectrum disorder. And so the idea here is um, because of certain things going on in the brain, people can't pick up on other signals that are going on in the world around them. So certain things, maybe me kind of looking away from you or looking down and not being interested is someone is something that your brain picks up and chemically signals to the other part, this person's no longer interested, or this person doesn't want to talk to you about that. And that signaling transfer can't happen in a brain with someone with autism disorder. There's also things like learning disabilities, Alzheimer's disease, neuron death, and then ALS is probably a big one that you guys have heard of. And these are all just from having too high levels of glutamates in specific regions of the brain. So how do we actually look at glutamate? We've decided, I hopefully have convinced you that it's important that we be able to, to look at what's going on with glutamate, but how do we do that? So we actually take each of these devices, again at the top, I'm showing you a cross section of the device straight on. What you're seeing in the middle of the screen is this device turned sideways, and then a side view of one of the disc, uh, silver disc electrodes, so one of the chemical sensors turned on its side. So I'm going to kind of show you what we put on the surface to make it into a chemical sensor. What we do is we put an electrical signal in. So that's what you're seeing over here on the far left. We put in this signal, and then we look for changes in current that come out based on interactions happening on this surface. And so what we'll do first is the goal of the next few minutes is going to be to create a way to selectively detect the Lucky Charms hat, but not any other Lucky Charms serial pieces going on. So, first, if we just leave this device in a serial solution, it actually won't look at the Lucky Charms hat, but it may give signals to a lot of other Lucky Charms present. This is like the worst case scenario, right? I've made a sensor that doesn't do at all what I want it to do. But what I can do is I can put a selective coating on this. So these are um, specific molecular structures or polymers that Allison and I will build up over these electrodes to selectively let certain serial pieces or really when we're putting in the brain, certain neurotransmitters through. Um, we will then add another layer that we can do this to as well. And we'll fill this with what's called an enzyme. So what you're noticing here is all of the other molecules are blocked. This is an enzyme. You guys may or may not know what an enzyme is, but that kind of looks like a Pac-Man, right? So if it, nothing else, remember, enzyme kind of looks like a Pac-Man in this cartoon because what the enzyme does is actually take that lucky charm piece it will eat it, essentially, break it down into a metabolite that can make it through that selective barrier that we've put up. So, again, I've built a detector that can look at, indirectly, how much of the Lucky Charms hats, or that particular marshmallow is in the cereal, by taking that marshmallow, having an enzyme interact with it to create a specific molecule that can go through the selective layer to then be sensed. I built this, but another thing I hope you take out of from this is, as scientists, you cannot just say something works and people have to believe you, you have to show people that it works. So here I'm going to show you how we test these sensors to guarantee that these layers um, are working. So again, on the far left, this is the sensor that I've built. In the middle, um, going back to the whole device, we will take that device, put it in a beaker, and we'll do injections of glutamate and other molecules to make sure that it's really only showing responses chemically to the molecules that we want. So here, again, the far left, what you're seeing on the right is time happening, and then on your uh, y-axis is actually current. So if this sensor is working correctly, you should see increases in current when glutamate is present, and you should see nothing happen when any other molecules are present. And so I will do an injection of glutamate. Again, that's literally taking a pipette tip and dropping some glutamate into a stirring solution. And what you see is a rapid increase in the current on the far right. So that's telling me my sensor is showing me a response to glutamate. I can continue to do this repeatedly, and I keep seeing these responses happen. 
Then what can happen is if I put another molecule in, for example, ascorbic acid. So ascorbic acid is also known as vitamin C. Um, it is everywhere in your brain, it is everywhere in your body, keeping you healthy, getting ready for radicals. But we don't want to look at it with this sensor, even if it is very important. And so what you see is there is no increase on our sensor to ascorbic acid, so that's great. We can also then use dopamine, another very important neurotransmitter, but not what we want to sense with the sensor, and you see no increase in the signal. So this tells us that our sensor is both detecting glutamate and detecting glutamate selectively, so it's not showing signals to other molecules or neurotransmitters as well. We then can look at what's our sensor performance. So when we're in the brain, we don't have the chance to do a nice injection of a known amount of glutamate to tell us how much glutamate we're seeing for a given current change. So what we can do is use um, a calibration plot, um, which is what you're seeing on the far right, and that basically gives us a relationship based on what we did in the beaker between current responses and the concentration of glutamate that are seen with them. And so here, again, this is kind of, on the far right, that plot is what we're using as our kind of legend to tell us what's going on in the brain. So, We've made a chemical neural interface. It can look at electrical signals and chemical signals in the brain. For the interest of time and just to focus, I'm going to just talk about the glutamate signals for the next few slides. But no, the same device can also get a lot of electrical signals out of the brain. So this is one of the first of these types of devices that we've built. So like the signals Allison was showing you, we're going to put this into the brain of an animal, not a human for the first try. And so what we do is this device is actually implanted deep into the brain, and those uh, Electrodes that were spread out in these three little sections are actually designed to hit three different regions of the brain that are all involved in learning and behavior, and specifically reward. So the idea being, when an animal gets a reward that it likes, you should see signal increases in all of those areas. Um, again, this is how the device is fixed in place. So again, if you were to just lower it into a beaker, that could be a problem, but if you actually want this animal to be able to run around, you need to fix it in place. So what you're seeing on the far right is actually an animal with one of these implants. Um, what the pink thing is on the top of his head is dental cement. A lot of the equipment that we use for uh, these brain implants is very similar to the dentist, dental equipment, but that is not his brain. His brain and his skull are completely sealed off. There has been uh, no effect there. That is just dental cement that's holding everything in place. And so he can run around, he can do everything he wants, and then when he's ready for recording, we uh, take him into a behavioral chamber. And what happens there is, at about the two minute mark, he's given uh, an actual sugar pellet, here represented again by a lucky charm. And so what you're looking at here is the glutamate concentration on the y-axis and the time course for him being in this chamber on the x-axis. And what you're seeing is two different sensors. One, the pink sensor, is your actual glutamate sensor. That is the uh, biosensor that's showing you signals to glutamate. The yellowish green one at the bottom is a control sensor. So that's just to make sure all of our coatings are still working and we're not seeing anything we're not supposed to. So the goal is the bottom line should be pretty flat, which it kind of it looks like. There's a few noise artifacts. But what you're seeing on the pink line is when the animal gets that kind of sugar pellet, um, there's a spike in glutamate, right? It's exciting to it, it's happy, this is what it wants. And so you see this signal of reward that's happening. But that was three days after implant, 10 days after implantation. This is actually what the signal looks like. Um, so what we're finding out is that after all of these surgeries, after training these animals, the sensors don't last as long as we want. So Allison's gonna come up and talk to you about some ways that she's been looking at to improve making these devices last long enough to make it worth putting them into someone's brain. mentioned how we make these devices, right? So she talks about all of the different exclusion layers, that enzyme layer. And so while she talked to you about that enzyme layer, what she didn't tell you is that the way we deposit it is actually by hand. So this is what we do. So here again is that device that you've seen pictures of before. Again, we're only looking at like, the large uh, metal electrodes as our chemical sensor. So if I want to coat just one of those large circles, what I have to do is actually use a very special tool. So that black line coming out from the corner is actually a special paintbrush that we buy that is a single camel eyelash that's attached to a paintbrush handle. 
So if I want to coat my electrode with enzyme, what I have to do is paint, take that little paintbrush, put it in my enzyme solution, and then under a microscope, so this is actually a picture of what it looks like under the microscope, I have to hold that paintbrush and carefully paint it on so that it's only covering just that large electrode without getting it anywhere else. So you can imagine it's as hard as it sounds. If I had to make 10 of these devices, you might imagine, you know, compared to the first device, by the 10th device, my hand is tired, my eyes are tired. I'm not going to be able to paint this very consistent, consistently from one device to the next, right? There might be ones where I don't paint the entire surface of the electrode. There might be ones where I paint too much, so it absolutely gets everywhere. So, as engineers, we want to take a step back and think, well, maybe this is the reason why the enzyme isn't lasting as long when we implant it into the brain. So are there other ways that we can move away from this hand-painted method? So one method we looked at is using a technique called electrochemistry. Um, so here, I'm going to walk you through the different steps. So on the very left is going to be, again, a cross-section of a device. So if I slice it through and we're looking at it on the side, those gray boxes on the top and bottom are going to be my microelectrodes, and you can kind of see the wires that would lead all the way up through the device. So say I want to designate the top electrode as my sensing site and the bottom electrode as my control site. So I want enzyme on the top electrode but not on the bottom. What I can do is immerse this device into a solution of a dissolved chemical called chitosin. So we're representing that by all of those little pink blobs there. What's unique about chitosin is that if I apply a special electrical potential to just the top electrode and not the bottom, the chitosin actually will salt out a solution and create a nice little film only on that top electrode while leaving the bottom electrode alone. So I can then take my device out of that chitosin solution and put it into a, a solution of dissolved enzyme. So again, that's those little blue Pac-Man that you see on the very right hand side. What's nice is that the enzyme actually really likes sticking to the chitosin. So wherever it sees chitosin, it's going to stick, but it doesn't really like to stick to the metal electrode. So what that means is I can now create a device where instead of doing all my hand painting, I can now do this all through electrochemistry. So I went ahead and tried this, and here are some results. So here's a picture of a device I tried. So here the microelectrodes are kind of these metal uh, ovals, and you can see that there's kind of three pairs of these metal ovals going up, right? So the ones that have, are, have the black arrows on top are the ones I designated as my sensing site. And about 50 microns away, you know, either the X or the Y direction, is going to be my control sensor. And what you can see is that I have these little dark blobs on top of my sensing site. That's actually the chitosin enzyme solution that I was able to successfully deposit. And you can see in this particular case, it only goes over the electrodes that have the black arrows, but it doesn't really go onto the electrodes that doesn't have the black arrows, right? So we were able to show that we're able that this works, that we don't have to do our hand painting anymore, and we wanted to characterize it a little bit further. What's nice is that by using this technique, it actually also makes the sensor even better. So here, what I'm doing is this bar graph is showing the comparison from the electrochemical method on the left-hand side and the hand painting method on the right. And the y-axis is measuring the sensitivity. So we can see here that by using electrochemistry, we get about a sensor that's about 13 times more sensitive to glutamate compared to when I do it with the hand painting method. Now that's good because basically with a higher sensitivity, I can make a device that detects even smaller amounts of glutamate so I can make it even more sensitive. So we were really, really happy with these results, so we wanted to now test the lifetime. So to give you some context, our electrical sensors, um, so the ones I showed you way back with the rat, after surgery, those can last more than 160 days in the brain, so about five months. And that's really great because you're able to track you know, long-term change, changes in the brain over time. So we were hoping that by using this electrochemical method, we can also see a similar increase in this lifetime. Unfortunately, our chemical sensor still only lasts about 14 days after implantation, even with this new electrochemical coding method. So we went back to the drawing board and we started to think, well, maybe it's about the environment of the brain that these sensors are seeing that's causing an effect on the lifetime. But again, instead of just saying it, we have to actually test if this is true. So I set up some tests that study the effect of the brain, or the effect of the environment of the brain on biosensor lifetime. So in this cartoon, I'm showing kind of three different soak solutions that I set up. And in each of those little vials, I put one of my little chemical sensors. So the vial on the left is a device soaking in phosphate buffered saline, or PBS. 
And this you can think of it as my control, so there's no chemicals present. It's really just at the same pH that you might normally find in the brain. The vial in the middle with the green, I mixed glutamate into the PBS to see, well, if the glutamate in the brain is causing the chemical sensor to degrade at a faster rate. On the right-hand side, I'm mixing ascorbic acid to see if, the effect, if ascorbic acid affects it. So again, as Anna mentioned before, it's everywhere in your brain, so we wanted to see maybe it affects this chemical sensor lifetime. So in, actually, in order to actually compare these numerically, what I did is run a calibration curve. So again, as Anna kind of briefly mentioned before, on the left is what I would see as I'm running an actual experiment where I'm looking at the passage of time in the x-axis, and on the y-axis, I'm looking at the current changes with my chemical sensor as it's immersed in a beaker. So if I put a little, one little injection of glutamate into my beaker, I should be able to see an increase in that current, which we can see on the left-hand side here, right? I can now translate that to my calibration curve on the right-hand side, where I'm looking at, as I increase the concentration of glutamate, what is that current level going to be? So that's going to be the current is measured on the y-axis. So again, if I start to build up this calibration curve, I do a few more injections of my glutamate. You can see I'm starting to add a few more of those orange dots to my calibration curve on the right. And you can see a slope is starting to appear, right? So by the end of my calibration curve, I can now make a slope on this right-hand right side. And now I can use that number and compare how that slope changes as the longer it soaks into each of these soaked solutions. So in this example here, again, I'm looking at that calibration curve on the right-hand side. What I saw was that I measure the response in week zero, which are those orange squares, and then I soak it, my device in a solution for one week, and I measure the exact same device again, which you can see are those blue dots. And what you can start to notice, even after only soaking for one week in my chemical solution, that slope, so that line, is starting to get a little bit more flat, right? A little bit more horizontal. So that's showing that my sensor is starting to degrade. If I look at week two, so that's the yellow triangles, you can see that it's starting to get even more flat. Week three, so my green triangles here, it's getting even more flat. And finally, by week four, so those purple diamonds, essentially, that's creating a completely horizontal flat line. And what that means is no matter how much glutamate I'm adding to my little beaker to test my device, the current isn't changing at all. So essentially, the device doesn't work anymore, right? So I went ahead and I did these same tests for all three of those soak solutions that I showed before. And so here, you can see a comparison. So again, I'm comparing the device soaking in PBS, glutamate, and ascorbic acid. And then on the y-axis is the percent drop in sensitivity the longer I soak it. So I want to emphasize that it's a percent drop, which means that the bigger that the bar is in this bar graph, the worse the device performed. So we can see that the device soaking in PBS showed about a 15% drop in sensitivity, but the device soaking in glutamate or ascorbic acid showed at least a 50% decrease in that sensitivity at, over the same time period. So now we're able to conclude that, indeed, some of the chemicals present in your brain is causing the the enzyme to degrade at a faster rate compared to just the device soaking on its own. So in the future, Anna and I are hoping to further engineer this and build, maybe you could think of it as kind of a shield over our little chemical or our enzyme layer as a way to further protect it from some of these in the brain environment and have a longer lifetime. So in conclusion, Anna and I spoke to you about how we make these neural interfaces in the clean room using microfabrication. We talked about how we use our neural interfaces to listen to electrical signals. We also talked about some of our newer work in terms of how we use them to listen to chemical signals. And in terms of what's next, to be honest, we're not sure. This field is so complex, it's so broad, there's so many unanswered questions about the brain. Um, who knows what, what will happen in the next you know, 20, 30 years. But what we're hoping is that with our talk, you can start thinking about some of the things that we might not know yet about the brain and hopefully inspire you to help answer some of these questions. And so with that, we'd like to thank you so much for your time and we'd be happy to take any questions.